thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really, it's wonderful to be here. Um, first of all, I describe myself as an aspiring sports journalist. Uh, so I know how those of you feel. Uh, I, I was originally supposed to fly in today, but as I'm sure you're aware, there's this uh, modest weather event up north. Uh, and so um, uh, the dean and I and some other folks talked over the weekend, and I decided to fly in yesterday because I don't think there were any flights out of Washington today. What that meant is that I had, I had all of today here in Columbia. And um, I'd never been here before, and I, I realized that it's a lot like a lot of places that I have been and I really like, a combination of college town and state capital, places like Austin and Madison. And these are just places with a ton of energy. Um, uh, they're, they're often affordable. Um, uh, and they're just interesting. And so I, I had a wonderful day. I walked around the State House grounds with all the great history there. I walked around the Horseshoe. I sat and had coffee at Drip, and I had lunch at the Mediterranean Tea Room, and really had a lovely day. So I want to thank you all for having me here. I specifically want to thank Dean Bierbauer. I want to thank Rebecca Friedman. I want to thank Mark Taji, um, and everyone else who, who did work around my visit. I also want to thank Mr. Baldwin and the Baldwin family um, uh, for hosting me here. Um, I uh, am going to talk mostly about um, uh, the rest of the world, not about journalism. Um, but I'm going to make sure I leave a whole bunch of time at the end um, um, so we can uh, talk a little bit more about journalism. I'm really talk about anything you want. I spent nearly all of last year on a project helping uh, the bosses at the Times design um, the newsroom of the future, something called Project 2020, how the New York Times should change. Um, uh, and so I've spent a lot of time thinking about journalism um, and would be happy to talk about any of that in the, in the Q&A. I'm going to touch on it lightly in the remarks. Um, I actually want to start by asking you all to, to think about your own family, um, and in particular to think about the stories that your family tells itself when you get around uh, a, a table at a holiday or when someone graduates from school. Um, in all likelihood, these are stories of progress. Um, in a room like this. Um, in all likelihood, they're miniature versions of the American story, the story of the United States. Maybe your ancestors hail from Italy, maybe they hail from Ireland or Poland or Russia and came over in the great in immigration wave around the turn of the 20th century, as one side of my family did. Maybe your family has been here for generations and endured the Civil War, the Depression, and so much else. Maybe your family came across the Rio Grande at some point in the last century and a half. Maybe your ancestors were enslaved not so many generations ago, or they sailed here from Asia or the West Indies or South America. No matter which of these describes you and your family, there is a very good chance that the stories you tell and that your family tells have something in common with the stories of other families that are quite different. And that common thread is progress. You talk about the material comfort and the opportunities that you enjoy that your ancestors could hardly fathom. You talk about how proud they would be about how their hard work and their sacrifice has paid off. Maybe it led to the first college graduate or the first PhD in the family. Maybe in the last decade, maybe much longer ago than that, or the first doctor in the family. Um, one of my four grandparents was an immigrant. Rene Leonhardt, he was a German Jew and a photographer, and he was on a business trip um, elsewhere in Europe, away from Germany in the 1930s, when he received word from a friend back home that said, don't come home. Um, Rene never did. Um, he sailed to the United States by way of Cuba. I always thought of him as a commercial photographer, someone who would have worked in a studio like the one I just saw around the corner here, um, uh, taking pictures for advertisements. But I recently had a chance through historical research to find the manifest, ship's manifest that he came over on, um, of the ship that sailed into Havana. And Rene Leonhardt, on that ship's manifest, when he had to put down what his job was, he put journalist. Um, back in Europe, he was a photojournalist. But when he got here to the United States, he couldn't pursue the career that he had chosen and he wanted to do, because it wasn't so easy as a German Jew getting here in the 1930s, um, escaping the Nazis, to just walk into a newsroom and get a job. So he did whatever he could do, which was get a job taking pictures of babies and other things for advertisements. Um, my grandfather's business was in a small little room in Times Square. Um, and so when I think about my family, I think about how fortunate I am that my grandfather did what he did and endured the sacrifices that he did um, and walked to work in a little, little office in a place called Times Square. He didn't get to be a journalist. 
I also walk to an office sometimes in Times Square, but I get to be a journalist, and I get to be a journalist to the place that is named, the Times Square is named for. And that's my own family's version of this story, where I look back and I think how fortunate I am that I essentially have gotten to be on the receiving end of all the hard work that others put in. If you think about these stories, they're not just stories about individual families. They're also stories about communities, about groups. They're stories of tribal pride, about Italians and Italian Americans, about Irish, about African Americans, about Jews, about Chinese Americans, about Latinos, and about so many other groups. They make you feel part of something larger, whether that something larger is your religion or your ethnicity or the country that you came from. They give you a sense that there is progress in the world and that the sacrifice you make for your kids will pay off the same way the sacrifice that your parents and grandparents have paid off for you. Now I want you to stop and imagine a different reality. Maybe some of you don't have to imagine, but in a room full of people going to a university like this, in general, most of you do have to imagine. I want you to imagine a reality in which your family has made scant progress for decades. You are no richer than your grandparents, and your grandparents were not rich. You're no healthier than your parents, and your kids are less healthy than you are. If this reality described you, you wouldn't be able to tell stories of upward mobility. You wouldn't be able to tell miniature versions of the American story, because they wouldn't be true. Instead, you would be frustrated about hard work gone unrewarded, and you'd be anxious for your children and for your children's future. This second reality is the reality for tens of millions of Americans today. That's what I mean by the great American stagnation. For a large portion of the population, life isn't much better than it was a generation ago, and in some ways, it is worse. Exactly how much of the population falls into this description depends on some really technical economic questions, like how you adjust for the value of money over time. Um, I would say it's about a third of the American population that falls into this description. If you want to look at the numbers differently and argue that it's 25% or 50%, I would respect that argument. But there are two things that are clear. It is a large portion of the American population. And no matter where you put that fraction, it is clear that the rate of progress in material living standards in this country has slowed really markedly. And that causes a lot of frustration. It is true in one area of life after another. It's true about health. Look at the obesity rate. It's true about drugs. Look at the rate of people dying from the opioid crisis. It's true about longevity, how long people are living, which in some ways is the single best measure of the quality of life in a society. It's true about income and wealth. It's true about family structure. It's true about some other things that we spend less time thinking about, like what portion of this country has spent at least some portion of their lives in a locked cell. The one big exception, and I don't want to ignore it or minimize it, is discrimination. Virtually every kind of discrimination has become less severe over the last generation. The progress has been surprisingly rapid. Religious discrimination, sexism, discrimination based on sexual orientation, discrimination against the disabled, particularly children who are disabled, and yes, racism. Of course, there is still terrible racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination in our society. It remains a stain on the American ideal, and we should fight discrimination the same way people who came before us did to ensure that progress continues. If anything, there have been recent worrisome signs of backsliding, the denial of the vote to African Americans, terrible treatment of Latinos and Muslim Americans, anti-Semitic threats and vandalism casual acceptance of sexism, and even sexual assault. Yet it's vital to recognize the progress in this area because it should remind us that progress is possible in these other areas where we've seen so much less of it. I will quote Barack Obama. You may remember him. He said, I always tell young people in particular, do not say that nothing has changed when it comes to race in America unless you've lived through being a black man in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. It is incontrovertible that race relations have improved significantly during my lifetime and yours, and that opportunities have opened up and that attitudes have changed. That is a fact. You could use that same description about many of the other areas that I just mentioned. 
One of our great challenges as a society is to figure out how we can extend the progress we've seen in these areas, not only in those areas, but in other areas. Extend the progress on discrimination and basic political freedom to the economy, to health, to education. Because as I said, the trends there are much, much darker. The typical household, amazingly, has a net worth that is 14% lower than the typical household did in 1984. That's more than 30 years in which our economy has gotten a lot bigger, and the typical family is less wealthy than it used to be. You've heard the income statistics, but sometimes, and this touches on what we'll talk about later about journalism, seeing something is better than, than hearing words or reading words. Um, don't worry if you can't read all the words on here. Um, this is a chart that shows the percentage change um, in different uh, income groups over, since 1973, which I either picked because I was born in 1973 or because it's the beginning of the modern economic era because of the oil crisis. Um, uh, so what you see um, in the, for the very top, so that is the richest one ten thousandth of households, their income has increased nearly 400% which is to say it's, it's increased by nearly a factor of five. And then you come down with each level that has gotten less rich, the increase is less. And you get all the way down to the median, which is the typical household. And it's not zero, but it's darn close to zero. And since the late 1990s, it is zero. You can see that line is no higher than it is. I want to emphasize this is change, not levels. So there is nothing that made it inevitable that the rich would be above the middle class. If we looked at this same graph in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, it would be flipped. The middle class received larger percentage raises than the rich did. This is a portrait of how much inequality has increased. If you want to see what that's meant for people's incomes, here is income in 1973. It's adjusted for inflation. So that, that family that was right at the cutoff for the top one ten thousandth was making $2 million in today's dollars. The family that was right in the middle, making half than more Americans and half than less, was at $50,000. I'm now going to fast forward in one slide to 2015. So I'll do that a couple times so you can focus on whichever one you want, right? <laughs> Those want that one at the very bottom, not growing a lot, right? Typical American household today, today earns $57,000. The cut to make it into the top 110,000 is 11 million. That's the cutoff. The average of the top 110,000 is much higher than that. That's, sing that's single year of income. Um, so this is where I'm briefly going to touch on a couple of journalism things, um, but sort of in a sneaky way. Um, <laughs> Uh, these are all snapshots. This is a, the snapshot of a single year of income. But what we really care about for this story I'm telling is progress, right? Um, are you doing better than you did when you started? Are you doing better than your parents? Can you have optimism that your kids will be doing better than you? Um, and that is where we need, we can use big data sets to see how things have changed over time. Um, one of the things that's changed in journalism is it used to be that we printed maps in the newspaper. And if you lived here in Columbia, South Carolina, and you wanted to know what was going on in your own region, you could kind of squint in the New York Times and see whether the shading of South Carolina was darker or lighter than the shading in Georgia. Um, now what happens is, when I called up this article when I was sitting in Drip earlier today, it immediately knew where I was sitting. Um, it knew I was in Richland County. Um, uh, uh, and it immediately told me, this is a map the New York Times has published, based on every county in the country, your odds of escaping poverty if you grow up as a low-income kid. Your odds of escaping poverty in Richland County are quite bad relative to much of the rest of the country. Red here means bad. And we'll, we can talk about that more later. Um, the southeast is quite bad. The industrial, parts of the industrial Midwest are quite bad. The upper Midwest and Utah are quite good, although they're hard to see. Also quite good are some of the major metropolitan areas of the coasts. There's, there's a focus on Richland. Um, Contra Costa County, just east of the Bay, um, uh, quite diverse county, very good for income mobility. Fairfax County, Virginia, also quite good for income mobility. So it, in places like Richland, the national trends are even more pronounced. The odds of having higher income than your parents are even lower here than they were. 
I don't want to just focus on income and wealth um, because they're not the most important things in life. Um, and if you look at some of the other things, in some ways they're maybe even more worrisome. Mortality. In other parts of the world, in Germany, in Canada, in England, in France, since the late 1980s, mortality rates for middle-aged people have fallen by 25 to 35 percent. That's good, right? The odds of dying in your middle age have fallen a lot. In this country, for white Americans, they've actually risen. The odds of dying between the ages of 50, 45 and 54 if you're a white American are higher now than they were 30 years ago. They're still lower than if you're a non-white American, but the trends are moving in the wrong direction. Why is this the case? It's largely increasing death rates from drug and alcohol poisonings, from suicide, from chronic liver disease, and from cirrhosis. The obes obesity rate in the United States has nearly tripled to 38%. The number of children living with only one parent or none has doubled since the 1970s to 30%. About 8 million people have spent time behind bars at some point in their life, up from only 1.5 million. So that's an increase of a factor of more than five. While college enrollment has grown, the norm for middle class and poor students is to attend a college and not to leave with a degree, which is a really bad combination. You get the debt and no degree. Why has this happened? What is behind the great American stagnation? There are four main causes, and I want to tick through them quickly. The first two I'm sure you've heard about and are familiar with, technological change and globalization. Most of you know the broad outlines of both of these stories. With globalization, it's the entry of China, of India, much of the rest of Asia, the former Soviet empire, increasingly South America and Africa, into the global economy. Let's be clear. This is a much more positive story than it is a negative story. It's the most significant reduction of poverty in world history. I encourage you to read a book called Getting Better by Charles Kenney, um, a book that more significantly Bill Gates also recommends or a book called The Great Escape by Angus Deaton, a Nobel-winning economist. They both cover this story really nicely. They're also fairly short and, and easy for lay people um, like me to understand. For thousands of years, Angus Deaton writes, those who were lucky enough to escape death in childhood faced years of grinding poverty. But that's not the case anymore. Life expectancy has risen a stunning 50% worldwide since 1900, and it's still rising. Despite the population explosion, the average quality of life has surged. The share of people living on less than a dollar a day has dropped to 14% from 42% in 1980. Things are getting better, as Deaton writes, and hugely so. There is, however, one huge downside to this great increase in wealth and decline in poverty in so much of the world, which is there's much more competition for those of us in the United States and Europe and Japan. I want to emphasize, despite what you may have heard from some politicians, this competition does not stem mostly from the signing of new trade agreements. I know they were central to Donald Trump's campaign. I reported from the Democratic Convention this year, and I saw how if you went to the Democratic Convention and you were an alien, you would have thought something called TPP was the worst thing that had ever happened in recorded human history. But trade agreements are not the main reason the US faces so much more competition than it used to. The fact is, this country didn't have a lot of trade barriers before any of these new agreements were signed. And that's why we've had Japanese cars here and German cars and Korean technology for years and years and years. The rise of globalization has not come from trade agreements. They exist on the margin. It's come from mostly from forces we don't control. Other countries have become more competitive, and technology has made it much, much easier for products and supply lines and information and ideas to cross borders. So that's force one, globalization. Force two is the effect that technology has within any one country. It can replace work that was previously done by human labor, whether that's manufacturing output. You've probably read about these programs that are automated to write earnings stories for journalism. Um, as a result of that, workers with less education and less advanced skills have struggled. But I think it's really important to remember that this notion of technology replacing jobs didn't just start, right? There are a group of people called the Luddites who worried that technology was going to eliminate all employment. People said the automobile was going to put everyone out of work, right? Because it's going to replace all the horse and buggy manufacturers. And it hasn't happened. It's really one of the oldest stories in economics. 
I realize I'm recommending a few books, but it's deliberate. They're books that I think for people who are not academics that allow us a little window into the most important ideas. There's a book called The Race Between Education and Technology by Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. All you need to do is hear that title. It is a race between education and technology, right? Do we get the skills and the education rapidly enough to take advantage of technology as it changes, or are we left behind? And the problem we have had is that as a society, we have been left behind. I know there's a lot of skepticism about education right now. If you're old like me, you, you remember an indigo girl's line. Um, I spent four years prostrate to the higher mind, got my paper, and I was free. As if the only use of a college education is um, the paper that you get at the end. Um, if you're somewhat younger, you probably are more familiar with Kanye West lyrics that um, I'm not going to quote for reasons that you can probably guess. Uh, but uh, the, the basic lesson is go to college, get a degree, and then you'll end up at the gap working for someone who never went to college. Um, uh, I would encourage all of you as citizens, as taxpayers, as people going out in the world to resist this skepticism about education. The evidence of the value of education is overwhelming. I could show you fancy papers with regression analyses that make the point, but there's actually a really elegant natural experiment that our society has conducted that gives you a sense of the value of education, which is over the last 30 years, we have taken two groups of people, and we've had one of them get much more educated, and we've had the other one remain roughly as educated as it was 30 years ago. So it's this great natural experiment. We can then study what's happened to the earnings of the people that got more educated, and what's happened to the group of people, the earnings of the people who didn't get much more educated. Even better, these two groups are randomly selected, which if we have any social scientists in the room, you know that's what you want for a really effective experiment. The name of the first group of people that have gotten much more educated over the last 30 years is women. The name of the second group of people who have not gotten much more educated over the last 30 years is men. Uh, men's wages are roughly flat over the last 30 years. Women's wages have gone up by a lot. Yes, the decline of sexism that I talked about before plays a role, but education plays a bigger role. Um, it's not just gender. If you look at regions of the country that have, had, um, have done much better economically, it's about education. Why isn't Boston yet another struggling um, New England post-manufacturing city? Why is Minnesota and Minneapolis doing so much better than so many other parts of the Midwest? Education is the central reason. And so the second crucial force is that education is so important, and yet we've fallen behind in education. We've fallen behind other countries, and we have taken vast portions of our population, and we have not given them the same kind of opportunities. I put together these numbers today, and we're not going to linger on them. Um, but I would argue this is a case that the University of South Carolina should think a little bit about. This is the share of students at each one of these universities who are, receive a Pell Grant, which means they come from roughly the bottom 40% of the income distribution. One of the things you'll notice on this chart, I picked a whole bunch of great public universities, um, is that the universities from places that tend to be bluer on that map you saw before, where it's easier to escape poverty, do a better job of getting really talented low-income kids onto their top college campuses. UVA, Clemson, South Carolina, and Georgia don't have as many. You guys have more low-income students than a lot of fancy private schools do, um, but you don't have nearly as many low-income students as the University of California campuses or a place like Rutgers. And there's a lot of research that shows those students are out there. They're just not getting to great universities like the University of Virginia. Um, the final two causes um, are... Um, uh, one is more, was more amorphous, which is, it's about our societal bonds. Um, uh, some people call this the bowling alone theory, um, which is the idea that as a community, we don't work together as well as we used to. I'm sorry, that's the fourth, right? So we've done globalization, we've done technology, we've done education, and now this is the fourth one. Um, Two-parent families are now the exception in many places. And while I don't in any way want to diminish the heroism of single parents, I think it's important to acknowledge that most children in our society do better if they grow up with two parents. As a society, we should be concerned about the decline of two-parent families, even as we do everything we can to support the work of one-parent families. I know there's a common view, particularly on the political left, that all this stuff just stems from economics, um, but I don't think that's right. I think that, yes, it's possible, in fact likely, that some of these declines of two-parent families, some of these other signs of societal breakdown like drug use, 
may have originally stemmed from economics. Um, but I think these other things have become a force in their own. If you look at the odds that kids have if they grow up in single parent families, if you look at some of these other things, I think the political right is correct that some of these breakdowns in communal relations and societal bonds have played a big role in some of the problems we have. I don't think the right has better answers than the left about it, but I think the right is correct that it's important. Um, uh, ma many of you may have heard of or, or even read Hillbilly Elegy, which is getting a lot of attention. He takes this point on directly in his introduction, um, and I think he's right about it in the introduction. So I've now taken you through the who, the what, the why of the great American stagnation. Obviously, the thing we care about is how do we fix it? What do we do about it? I would say the first thing, as minor as it is, is that people like us in rooms like these who are on the happy end of most of these trends need to recognize the depth of the problem. Our lives, for the most part, have improved. The divorce rate for college graduates is a lot lower than it used to be. The income trends for college graduates are quite positive. Um, unless you are a white, straight, Protestant man, um, and uh, white, straight, Protestant men make up a real minority of the American population, you benefit directly from the declines in discrimination that I described earlier. And so many of us in rooms like this have not experienced this huge stagnation over the last 30 years. And I think it's important to recognize that so much of the anger out there, so much of the frustration, whether it's frustration we see uh, manifesting itself in really unproductive ways or more productive ways, comes from something real. It comes from a frustration that if we had experienced what those people had experienced, we would have the same frustration. And recognizing that I would rank this with climate change as one of the two central problems that our society faces. And it makes every other problem harder to solve, including climate change, because it makes people less willing to make sacrifices today for the long term. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is resist the siren song of magic bullets, to mix metaphors, that fit any one of our own preconceptions. Right. So is the answer to all of this problem that the 1% are evil? Is the answer to all of this problem that if only we cut taxes, um, we'd solve all our problems. I would argue the evidence is overwhelming that there is no magic bullet like that. We tried cutting taxes. Um, we did it in the last 15 years. Didn't do a lot for the economy. And so I don't think there are magic bullets that are going to solve this problem. I think it's a combination of things. I think it starts with education. I think it involves figuring out ways to get people back to work. I think it may involve giving people money. Um, straight out, which is to say tax credits, although I don't think money is enough because I think work is really important to dignity in people's lives. I do think it's about health care, which is why I don't think it's a good idea to take health care from 24 million people. And I think it's about family. I think it's about thinking about what kind of policies we might be able to put in place that could actually help some of these declines in societal bonds. You sometimes hear people say, well, George Bush tried. He had some initiatives around increasing two-parent families and it failed, so let's give up. I think that's a mistake. George Bush took on a hard problem, um, didn't come up with a solution. Um, let's keep looking for other solutions. I think there may be ways in which communities and maybe even government policy can try to do things around things like um, community bonds and two-parent families and stuff like that. The subtitle of this talk is about how Donald Trump got elected, um, and yet I've barely talked about it. But I hope the connections between what I'm talking about and him are obvious, whether you support him or whether you don't support him even if you're very alarmed by him. I would argue that he tapped into this frustration better than any politician of either party um, in several years. He made people feel like, who, he made people who were angry and frustrated and scared feel like he was going to fight for them. I currently see no sign that he has policies that are going to fix these problems. I think in some areas they're unlikely to matter much. I think in other areas, like taking health insurance away from people, they are going to be outright damaging. But whether you support him or oppose him, I think the search for solutions to this problem is going to end up dominating many of our adult lives. Because even if you are on the right side of this problem, even if you are a college graduate who benefits from many of the improvements in our lives, <coughs> you will be affected by this problem. Because a society that has large numbers of people not experiencing rising living standards is not a healthy society. And ultimately, the problems that affect those people will come around and they will affect people who are doing quite well day to day. 
they'll affect climate change, they'll affect a society's institutions. And the only way I can see that the United States has nearly a good, as good a next 50 years and 100 years as the last 50 years and 100 years is for us to make substantial progress on these sorts of issues. Thank you again for coming. So we can do Q&A on anything I talked about or nothing I talked about. <laughs> um, uh, I welcome disagreement, uh, criticism. Uh, could I just ask you to identify yourself and try to keep it as short as possible so we can get as many folks as possible? I'm Jay Bender. I'm a retired professor. <laughs> Our loss of commonality seems to track the loss of the notion that the people who are best off have an obligation to share their wealth to raise the rest of us. And since Ronald Reagan, the notion is government, which is our most common activity, is the enemy. How do we address that problem? Great question. Um, uh, I think government does some things poorly. And I think those of us, and I'm one of them, now that I'm on the opinion side of journalism, who believe that government can be a great force for good, should often acknowledge that, right? The, uh, there are many things that government does poorly. Setting airline prices, government was really bad at that, and it's great, I think, that they don't do it anymore. Um, uh, not only that, but this huge decline in poverty and this great rise in living standards in China, in India, in so much of the world, is because of capitalism, right? It's because those, company, those countries became more capitalist, because they welcomed market forces, and capitalism is a wonderfully <coughs> productive economic system um, that leads to rising living standards for lots of people. Um, there is no model of a country that has had really good rising living standards with a government-run economy. I don't think there's one. Right? China's great boom is when they step back significantly from it. So with that as a long preface, there are many, many things that the private market simply won't do or it will do them poorly. There is no profit in caring for an ill 95-year-old um, often. There is no profit often in taking care of a 3-year-old or a 4-year-old. Or when there is profit, it doesn't line up with other societal interests that we have. The same goes for road building. The same goes for many, many things. The easiest way to see this is to see all the inventions that we benefit from today that government started, right? Like the internet. The internet was built by the United States Department of Defense because private companies didn't see any profit in that kind of really early stage stuff. So I don't know the answer to your question. I absolutely agree that this notion that government is the problem, that we just need to get it out of the way, does us great damage. The closest I can come to try to combating that is to acknowledge government's shortcomings and also celebrate government's many, many successes. Whether it's the creation of the internet, whether it's the best drug industry in the world, which isn't because um, our people are smarter, it's because we had a government that funded some really important early stage research. Whether it's through great institutions like this one, like the University of California, that exist because of government money. That's the only way I know to say that essentially what government is, is it's people banding together and doing things that individually they could not do on their own. Yeah, Augie Grant. I'm a uh, professor here in the School of Journalism. Um, at the root of everything you had to say was numbers, yet the challenge we have is people aren't believing the numbers. Because, yes. Because uh, anyone can present any number they want. How do we handle that challenge? Yes, I've heard I'm an enemy of the people. <laughs> um, uh, you're right. I mean, so numbers are... Uh, Numbers are just facts, right? There's nothing, I mean, people can make up their own facts, they can make up their own numbers, they can make up whatever they want. The, the, uh, I had a nice conversation, uh, I saw Gray in the audience somewhere with Gray, who's a student here before, um, that, uh, uh, related to this. The decline in trust in the media is a really important problem. It's not about the media. So, it, we make mistakes in the media, we can talk about those. But um, uh, some of the accusations against us, I think, are true. I think on some issues, there are some biases that, that are problematic.
But the decline of trust in the media mirrors the decline of trust in Congress, organized religion, labor unions, corporations, Wall Street. Essentially, every major institution in American society has suffered from a rapid decline of trust with one exception. Anyone know the exception? Military, yes. Uh, military. Um, uh, military, if anything, is flipped, right? I'm sure, I'm not one of them, but I'm sure there are people in this room old enough to remember when the military was deeply distrusted. Um, uh, so the decline in trust in the media is, is a little bit worse than some of those other ones because we didn't start at the top. <laughs> um, but, um, but, e but it's not a media story. It's about decline of trust in all kinds of things. And I would argue that it actually stems from many of these forces I was just talking about, which is a sense that people think society's not working from them, for them and they don't trust it. In terms of the specific question, I don't think we can stop using facts or stop using numbers because there are people who don't trust them or because there are people who lie. I think what we have to do is have some basic core faith that truth is ultimately more powerful than falsehoods and attempt patiently to continue to point out truth, to do it calmly, and to try to point out ways that things are true and things are false. We're seeing a really good example this week of what happens when you build something around something that is false. As my talk made clear, probably, if you were to guess, my politics are left of center, but not that far left of center. I'm guessing I'm to the right of a fair number of people maybe in this room, on most college campuses I are. But the Republican healthcare strategy for years has been based on a falsehood. And they just paid the price for that, which is when you base everything you're saying about healthcare on stuff that's not true, and then you try to write a healthcare bill that fixes all these problems that you've been not telling the truth about, it's really hard to write a bill that isn't a disaster. Um, and so the only thing that I can think of is to continually trying to patiently make arguments and point out things that are um, that prove what's a true fact and what's an alternative fact. <laughs> Another professor, retired professor, I just wanted to say kudos. I have a long interest in how the press covers inequality issues, etc. And Upshot uh, is fantastic. Thank you. And I think one of the things that you're doing that helps, and I hope a lot of journalists and academics realize this, is if you want to get introduced to the scholarship that's been done on some of these issues, places like the Upshot that provide links to data sets, big data sets, and the original articles are great. So I, I hope we're teaching journalists and behavioral scientists to know how to go and unlock the knowledge that's in these original studies. Because when you do a little profile on Piketty's work, or SACE or somebody else and provide direct links to the actual data or few data sets, I mean, it's a great public service. Did you see that? Uh, I don't know whether you, I assume you can't, all can't see oh, the footnotes, saw, but you see Sias's name is at the bottom of Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, see, that's where a lot, I think a lot of intelligent people that want to know well, who's doing the best work in some of these areas, at least you're focusing on folks that then other scholars can go to and say, well, we can get, I'm, I can't tell you how many times I've found new research because I saw something you wrote for uh, a columnist. Thank you. Post is focused on. So it you, great. It used, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It used to frustrate me to no end that the academics, and I don't mean journalism academics, I mean you know economists and political scientists, used to frustrate me that they couldn't explain things very well that I'd get on the phone with them and I'd say, well, can you explain this to me? And they'd explain it and I had no idea what they were talking about. And I sometimes felt like I had 45 minute conversations in which literally the only question I asked again and again and again was, I'm sorry, can you explain that again? <laughs> and then I realized I shouldn't get frustrated about this because if they could explain it, I wouldn't have a job, <laughs> right? <laughs> My job, they're doing really important, great work but they don't always speak English when they describe it, and my job is to, is to sort of be the middle person. I'm going to use that as an excuse to talk about something that the dean encouraged me to talk about very briefly, and then I want to take more questions. Um, uh, so I spent last year on this 
thing called the 2020 Project. You can read our final report online, Google, New York Times 2020. We published our report. People said, well, that must have been the, that wasn't the real report. No, that was the real report. We published the real report with criticisms of the New York Times and everything, um, uh, including excerpts of an internal survey where people complain about their editors. Um, uh, if you want that, skip straight to the back. Um, uh, and the basic argument that we made in the report is that the New York Times, but I think this applies to more than just the New York Times, doesn't apply to every business, but every journalist. The New York Times is not chasing clicks. We're not trying to win a page view arms race. There are, there are businesses out there that are doing that, and I really hope some of them succeed. They're going to build a huge audience. They're going to essentially sell really cheap advertising, but if the audience gets big enough, you multiply that, the really cheap advertising you're seeing on the web, you have a real business. You can employ journalists. That's why I hope it works. Um, our business is different. We are trying to build, and we are succeeding, a large subscriber-based business. But if I write an article that gets a million page views about diet or weather or sex or pets or real estate, those are the things that get huge amounts of clicks. Um, and my colleague writes an article um, that is the single smartest thing um, that anyone has written about Europe lately. And my article about real estate gets a million clicks. And her article about Europe gets 100,000 clicks. But it causes some people to say, wow, that was worth my subscribing. I'm going to subscribe. Her article was more valuable than mine. And that's the business that we are essentially pursuing. We're not trying to maximize clicks. I'm not saying we're immune to clickbait. Um, uh, we all want to have our stuff read, right? But, but that's not our business model. Our business model is a subscriber-based business. It's to find a few million people around the world who are willing to pay us for what we do. And then we are essentially working for those readers, right? We are going to Afghanistan for those readers. We are the ones who are reading those terribly boring Federal Reserve reports for those readers. We're, we're doing that for them. If you think about what that means, and I'm now speaking to the students in the room, for what kind of skills you should have to get jobs at places that are trying to do that. And it's not just the subscription-based business. If Ezra Klein, the editor of Vox, were here, I think he'd say the same thing. I know he would. I've heard him say it. You need knowledge and skills. You need something that makes what you are doing so valuable that people are willing to devote either time or time and money to it. So if you decide to go into business journalism, you need to know more about business than most of your readers. If you decide to go into sports journalism, you need to teach me something about the NCAA tournament, right? Because I don't need to pay to find out who's the eighth seed in the West bracket. Lots of people are doing that free. But if you write something that tells me about how the eighth seed in the West bracket runs its offense, and I didn't know it, and the only way you could have written that was if you've studied and reported on and researched basketball, that is really valuable, and that will cause you to stand out, and it will make readers give you their time, and it will make editors hire you. And so the returns to expertise in journalism have really risen. Our job used to be, to some extent, to be megaphones. To the companies and businesses and governments could not get their message out without us. Now they can. And so what that means, it's the same kind of race between education and technology. It means you need to have enough knowledge and enough skill to be able to provide readers with something that they couldn't get elsewhere. I actually find that really, really exciting. I think it makes the job more interesting, but it does mean you want to get those skills and knowledge. Hi, uh, I'm Jason Drain. I'm here. Uh, I just want to do two things about the idea of universal basic income. Um, I think that the question. What do I think of universal basic income? So I kind of alluded to it, and maybe that's why you asked. Um, this idea that basically we say, okay, as a society, we're pretty rich. We may not always feel that way, particularly after a talk like the one you just heard. But we really are quite rich. There are very few societies that have ever been as rich as this society. And so we essentially decide that rather than mucking up with all these complicated tax credits for poor people or fighting over minimum wage laws, we're going to say that we're going to have a universal basic income of, say, what? What's the reason? $10,000? Essentially, the government, rather than ha it's going to take all the money it's now effectively spending on tax credits and wage subsidies and all this stuff, and it's going to give everyone $10,000. It's getting a lot of attention right now. There's a, there are a bunch of books out about it. There's some more books coming out about it. If 
as if I'm allowed to say this as an opinion columnist, I don't exactly know what I think. <laughs> but I'm skeptical. So I, I think that it has some clear benefits, and often we should just be giving poor people money when we want to improve their lives, rather than doing stuff that's more complicated like the earned income tax credit. But I really do think there's something about the dignity of work that leads to um, all kinds of healthy behaviors. And having people not work um, leads to all kinds of healthy behavior, unhealthy behaviors. And to be clear, when I say work, I'm including stay-at-home parents. I'm including people taking care of aging, aging parents. Um, but the huge rise of non-work that we've seen in this society, which is overwhelmingly among men, is not among men staying home to take care of their kids. It's, it's, a, it's a rise of idleness. And it's really bad, because when people drop out of the labor force, they often never come back. Um, they go from being a taxpayer to being um, a drain on taxes. And they also are often depressed, and they're unhappy. And so I would worry about universal basic income um, no, not only not solving some of those problems, but exacerbating others of them. But it has strengths. Yes, so the great thing about this data is um, it's all public. If you go to something called College Navigator, you can pull up any school you want. Click on financial aid and then look at the Pell share. In fact, I did this this morning at the now oft mentioned drip. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, so, <laughs> yes, exactly, I want a discounted drip next time I go there. Um, uh, so you can look up all this. I, I actually, this is sort of an obsession of mine. Um, uh, I, um, uh, there are a lot of really hard problems to solve in our society. Um, I don't think it should be that hard to take really talented low-income kids who've overcome the odds and done really well despite growing up in tough circumstances and not having gone to very good high schools and they still do really well in the SATs and they get A's and we still don't enroll them at really good colleges. I think we should be able to fix that problem before we fix a lot of other problems. Mm -hmm. So I write a lot, thank you, I write a lot about that issue. Um, I have also found that colleges are sometimes amenable to um, pressure on this issue. Um, uh, Washington University was for years the university, the least economically diverse um, top university, a university of any kind in the United States. Its Pell share was something like six. Um, they got sick of being referred to as the least economically diverse university in the United States. That's Washington University in St. Louis, the private university. And they just announced a huge financial aid increase. So. Um, some private universities are really good on this. Vassar is really good on it. Amherst in Massachusetts is really good on it. The president of Davidson College in North Carolina, Carol Quillen, has made this a big emphasis. They still have a ways to go, but they're pretty good on it. Franklin and Marshall in Pennsylvania is good on it. Um, community colleges are great on it, but they have a different problem, which is their dropout rate is super, super high. And so what we need to do is we need to take the schools that have good graduation rates, like the one we're standing in, <laughs> and we need to make sure that they become more economically diverse. Ideally lift some of their graduation rates as well. Um, and then we need to take the schools that are already super diverse and figure out ways um, to lift the, the graduation rate. The most heartbreaking thing is that there are kids who thrive in high schools, do really, really well. And then for one reason or another, they don't go here. They don't go to Davidson. They don't go to Harvard. They go to their local community college, and they never finish. Um, uh, and it seems to me that's, that's a real, that's, that is us as a society letting those kids down. To follow on that, the thought, which is uh, coming more and more in some politicians' mind, is perhaps free community college. But also, I spent a lot of time in Germany, and Germany as a society feels that it needs to s divide those going into upper echelons <coughs> of education and into more uh, sort of professional uh, trades, which becomes a real societal division, yep. but yet someone who can be a plumber has a pride but also an income. Is there any way that the United States could make those switches to allow people that that may do well in high school, but really need a trade, need an income. Yeah. 
I, is that a solution for idleness? I, I do think it would be great if we had much better technical education. I absolutely agree with the premise of your question. We don't want to create a divide, right? Um, uh, we want to make sure that, um, uh, that anyone who wants to aspire to their kids go to a four-year college, which honestly is the vast majority of people, right? When you hear a journalist say that college isn't for everyone, say to that journalist, is it for your kids? <laughs> um, right? So I think, I think we should let everyone aspire, basically, which is already the case. We should help everyone to reach their aspirations of going to a four-year college. But there are going to be many people who decide that's not what they want, and the quality of technical education we have needs to be better. The weird thing is we kind of already have community free community college in this country. If you look at the data, the average tuition net of financial aid at many community colleges is zero. But there are two problems. Um, that's not enough, right? You can't live on free tuition. You gotta live on, on something else. We gotta help those kids do stuff. The other thing is, I was originally a skeptic of free college, in community college, because it's sort of already free, as I said, and I would worry that it basically ends up making it free for people who don't need it to be free. But I've changed my mind a little bit about that, because places like Tennessee and Chicago, Tennessee under a Republican, Chicago under a Democrat, that have said free community college, there's huge advertising value in saying that. There are a lot of low-income people who, even though it's free, don't know it's free. And so when you announce free college, it seems to have this electrifying effect that causes people to go, who wouldn't go? Uh, Linda Pollock, I'm an attorney. Um, you talked about people being frustrated Yeah, so this, so and, and if you think about, um, the numbers will be a little bit different for each country, but if you think about the forces that I described that are causing this, they're also affecting those countries, right? Some of them are a little better off because some of them have done better with education. Germany, actually, is the perfect example. Germany's numbers look better in part because not just the trade stuff, but in general it's made more educational progress than we have. But in general, yes, you see in a lot of these places, essentially, this, this boom of globalization and technology has been great for the bottom, most of the bottom 60 or 70 percent of humanity. It's also been great for the top two to three percent of humanity, and we're all in the top two to three percent of humanity, in the, basically, in the United States. It has not been so great for the next 27 or 28 percent, which is the, basically the working classes throughout much of Europe and the United States. So, yes. Uh. Say three years down the line or during the next election cycle, what do you see America like? And what do you think the big issues would be? What politicians will talk about? Would be kind of like picking up the pieces of like broken America or what? What do you see three years down the line? Presidents don't have as much impact on the economy as we often ascribe to them. I don't mean you, I mean all of us as a society. Um, uh, and so I think there's a lot that's going to happen regardless of what. Trump is or isn't doing. He could certainly start a crisis of some kind that would be terrible for the economy. Um, he could fail to manage a crisis, an economic crisis that would be bad. So I think most of his effect on the economy, I don't mean on society, but on the economy, is unlikely to manifest itself for quite a long time. I agree with you, as I said, I don't see him proposing solutions to a lot of these problems. I think all of us should be very humble about predictions after the last 12 months. Um, uh, uh, or certainly someone whose record was as bad as mine, which is, you know, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of people who made predictions. Um, uh, um, so with that, I think the most likely thing is that many of the same things that caused this frustration will continue. Um, uh, and he will seem to become as more of a problem with it rather than the solution, and that will be bad for him. I do worry you see him starting to line up the way other people have pointed out, the way authoritarian leaders in other countries have done, pointing out enemies, right? And so I could absolutely see him pursuing a strategy of 
everything would have been fine except for these federal judges who ruined everything, except for these immigrants who ruined everything, except for those reporters who ruined everything. Um, uh, so I don't exactly know how it will turn out, but I think um, governing is really hard. Uh, and um, uh, I think the odds of him having a successful presidency are well less than 50%. He has overcome odds of well less than 50% multiple times before, and so. Yeah. Yes. First of all, thank you for subscribing. Um, uh, I mean, you, you, so my biases are so obvious that um, uh, that I probably don't need to state them, right? I work there. Uh, but no, I'm a huge, as an employee there, I'm a huge fan of this Ox Salzberger family, and I'll tell you why. Um, you were right that if I were a shareholder, I might wonder why I don't have more rights. Um, but of course, if I were a shareholder, I could sell my stock and go buy stock in another company that did. Um, uh, the Salzberger family has this incredible history. They've made mistakes the way every, anyone would in terms of, of investments they've made and not made. But they have this incredible history of investing in journalism and not dictating coverage. Um, uh, they play uh, no role in the newsroom. <laughs> uh, in my 17, almost 18 years there, um, uh, I've never seen them get involved in a single uh, news story whatsoever. Um, I basically didn't know members of the Salzberger family at all until last year when I worked on this project that involved business stuff and ended up spending a lot of time with them. But it's a family that has invested huge amounts of money in journalism and is in it because they care about the idea of journalism and information. There are two slightly different aspects of your question. One is, is the editorial board positions of the New York Times, are they in the right place or should they move a little bit? I basically alluded to the fact that my politics are somewhat to the right of where the editorial board is, but the editorial board has a very well-defined position and, and what it is, and it happens to be the position that many of our readers share, and so maybe it is in fact the right position. I think you could sort of argue where on the spectrum that should be, and that's an interesting debate to have. But, um, but in terms of the Sulzberger support for the newsroom and the news gathering functions, their family could make huge amounts of money mostly by doing one thing, which is selling the New York Times. The quality of the New York Times brand is such that um, they could be much, much richer um, if they sold the New York Times tomorrow. And the fact that they haven't is because they basically believe in the mission of the Times. And when I look around and I see colleagues of mine and great journalists who work for Rupert Murdoch and colleagues of mine who work for big companies that don't share the values, um, I'm mostly um, overwhelmingly deeply grateful to work for a place that has had this family that essentially believes in the idea of journalism and facts and has essentially, I'm not saying, they're doing fine, <laughs> but has chosen, has decided that they care much more about that than they do about maximizing their family's wealth. David, we're at 10 after 8. You're okay. Free, you're free to go as long as you want. Uh, I'll take two more. Uh, Yes. I wasn't good enough at math. <laughs> uh, I, math was always my favorite subject. Um, uh, and I got to college, and I made the mistake of majoring in it because I couldn't get out of my head the self-image of, of a math major. Um, but I, two things happened. One, I wasn't good enough at it. Uh, and two, I realized that as you got more and more into math, it wasn't about describing the world. What I loved about math, despite your question earlier, it's a way to describe the world. I had the second grade teacher named Mrs. Sandler, who, who not, didn't put it in that way, because I was seven at the time, but I wrote my college essay about her, who essentially showed us that that's what math was. 
in our little seven-year-old ways. And that's what I always loved about math. And as you get into higher, kind of higher math, I went to a math class and they said, you're not gonna see a number until second semester. And I thought, I like numbers. <laughs> um, but, it was, but, but it was also that I realized that I just, there's a level of, um, there's a level of kind of quantitative, just it's almost like pure athleticism <laughs> that I didn't have. Um, uh, the good news is, is that the woman who's now one of my wife's best friends, the woman who helped me get through my math classes as, as a friend and helped me do my problem sets, she went to work for the NSA. <laughs> That's what we want as a society. Uh, yes? Great. And let me take the one behind it, too, since I wanted to call on both of you. And I'll do both at once. Yes. So I was wondering, like, as like individuals, but also writers, how can we create meaningful content in discussions with those people who might not always be on the level of like analyzing this kind of data? Great. I'll take them in order. So um, I think parts, I think parts of the um, administration's attitude toward the press don't worry me that much. Um, we're still going to be able to do our jobs. The larger we in the press, and you see that. You see great <laughs> scoops in um, all these papers. All, all the things we know about what's going on behind the scenes are because of journalists, and not columnists like me, reporters who are out there for TV networks and newspapers and websites and radio stations doing real work and telling us what's going on. And people don't realize just how much baseline, your dean can tell you this from having worked in Washington for a long time, how much baseline hostility there is between the press and the government. And so a lot of this, you know, I mean, the day that the Supreme Court upheld Obamacare, I was getting inundated by people from the White House who were angry that our headline wasn't positive enough. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say, get something better to worry about. Like, you just had the Supreme Court rule in your favor. The fact that the New York Times headline is, is not positive enough, you should not, should not be on your list of top 100 things to worry about. But that's the kind of stuff that we in the media are constantly used to, whether it's a Democrat or Republican administration. So there are parts of the tensions that they're always there. The public is becoming more aware of them. They don't worry me. There are parts that I find deeply chilling. And the language that you hear about enemy of the people and this notion of trying to delegitimize not just the media, but every single source of independent facts, whether it's the federal judiciary appointed by Republicans or Democrats, whether it's the Congressional Budget Office appointed by Republicans, whether it's scientists, whether it's intelligence agencies, or whether it's the press, trying to delegitimize all of those folks is chilling because what it is, and I'm not saying we're there, it's the kind of behavior you see from autocrats in countries where the leaders want to control the entire flow of information. And I think it's really important that everyone understand that although we are very early on that, and I don't think we'll ever get too late on it, but the only way we won't get late on it is if people refuse to accept it. If they say whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat, whether I'm far right or Bernie Sanders fan, I don't want my government being the only one that is allowed to provide information with me. I want other people doing it. And that is why to hear the President of the United States and people who work for him describe federal judges this way and describe journalists this way, whatever you think of those judges and journalists and people who work at the CIA and Congressional Budget Office people, I think it's really important for everyone to say, no, that is not American and that's not what we do in this country. And that's that right. part I find you. Perfect way to end, how not to be condescending. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's important to, to recognize, to take people really, to take them at their own word and to recognize that we all have things that matter deeply to us and that those things are really different. And I'll use a small example. One of the things that you often hear in um, more liberal places is why do those people vote against their economic interests? Can't they see they're voting against their economic interests? Um, well, I'll tell you some other places where people vote against their economic interests. Um, my neighborhood, um, uh, Scarsdale, New York, uh, the suburbs of Chicago and Silicon Valley, um, those people vote against their economic interests. They vote for tax increases on themselves. So why do they do it? Um, uh, uh, well, they do it because other things matter more to them. Um, and I don't think they're stupid for voting for tax increases on themselves. 
And the flip side is, it's important to think about why are people voting, quote, against their economic interests on the other end. It's because they care about things that are real. It's because they believe that abortion is the taking of a human life. And that's a serious and honest view that they have. It's they believe that Americans should have access to guns and they think that's a higher principle than the relative um, uh, homicide statistics country by country. And I think the best thing that we can do as a society, whether we come from the right or come from the left, is try to take people's ideas seriously and recognize that even if they're different, they have them for real reasons. Um, and that's not gonna necessarily persuade people of what our attitude is. But if you, my wife likes to say that in an immediate family, there are pretty close to no lies. If you wanna be, if you wanna persuade your sister or your child or your parent that you're okay with something that they do, you actually have to get okay with something they do. And there is a more gentle version of that with society, that we have to decide that we're essentially, no matter how much we may disagree with other people, gonna take their ideas seriously and try to engage with them and respect them. And that's the closest that I think we can come to. This has been a huge treat. Thank you so much for having me.